So as strange as it may sound, there's actually quite the debate going on in amongst the YouTube community in regards to whether or not is the earth round or is it flat. And I've been interested in this topic for about a year and I've been hesitant to get involved in this. I wanted to do a uh, laser experiment over a large lake and uh, I kind of told myself I'm either going to become louder or quieter on this topic based on the results that I find. So this is the sled that I got to use for this experiment. A couple of things that I really liked about it was the reverse which was handy for getting off the trailer and also the speedometer was in miles that was very handy for doing some measuring on the lake. I did check that odometer prior to going out there over a known one mile distance so it seemed to be quite accurate. So we made a trip out to Rock Lake, Manitoba and we unloaded at the northeast corner of the lake. There's actually a boat ramp there for summer. From there we used the sled to pull our equipment over to the other side right around in this area and then uh, the laser would have a nice access to the far end of the lake. So the far end of the lake, I'm, I'm not totally sure exactly where we ended up with that laser. It was either like right in this area here somewhere, maybe a little farther up, or even in this little area here. So the distance calculator pegs this at 7.5 miles and a little bit of change. I zeroed the odometer on the sled before I came back on my return trip it showed 8.2 miles so and I know I didn't drive exactly straight on the way back because I'm trying to keep the laser out of my eyes and stuff so we, we could be actually higher than uh, 7.5 miles I think 7.5 is maybe slightly conservative so but we're gonna go with that so we ended up digging to the bottom of one of the typical snow drifts that were out on the lake and setting the barrel on the ice and one of the measurements that I should have taken with a tape measure when I was out there is from the ice to the center of the lens. And so I'm doing that now and it works out to, it looks like right in at 40 and 3 quarter inches. So that's an important measurement for later in the video. So that may or may not be exactly what I had out there but it should be really close. So these radios were going to be our only form of communication across the lake and this is the packaging that they came with. So advertised for up to 50 mile range and unfortunately they let us down so at long distances across the lake we could not communicate it was just silence. So the next plan was to use this flashlight and this is 6,000 lumens really bright you can find these on eBay for like 20 25 dollars or so and so what we did is I signaled him with different speeds. Fast was raise it up, low speed was to lower the laser. So this is the laser here, just this little black box and it runs on 12 volts. So I've got it attached to a telescope which I use as a collimator lens and I use the telescope to adjust the size of the dot or the beam. So yeah unfortunately once I ran into trouble with the radios then I abandoned the idea of adjusting on the telescope. So I'm just leaving the laser sight here and the plan was to try and keep the laser at my back. Occasionally you will see the laser shining on the sled and sometimes I would lose the laser a little bit and I found by looking around in the dark I could see where the beam was and then move the sled in line with the laser again. Sometimes I would lose the beam a little bit extra and I found that by looking back I could always see that little green dot off in the distance and then see where the beam was going from there and then I would find the beam again and keep going. So before it got too dark and before I left with the sled what I did to set the initial level on the laser was just shine it down the lake approximately where I thought it might be about the right height and so we were anticipating we were going to have to fine tune it as we went along and so uh, sure enough quite a ways down the lake I found that the beam was getting higher and higher so I stopped the sled, signaled back to the laser operator to lower the beam a little bit and then uh, continued on. Quite a ways down the lake there was a fishing shack that was fairly near the path of the beam and that would have been quite time consuming for us because I would have had to go all the way back to the laser, move it over a little bit and then uh, continue on if it had actually been right on that little fishing shack. 
continued on. Then after a while I could see the dim green illumination on the bank with uh, some stuff growing out of the bank. Okay, here's the bulrushes. So I'm gonna find it here. Okay. So there's the ice. I'll turn this light off. I'm trying to get out my camcorder right now. Okay. All right, so. <clears throat> so right now. <clears throat> So right now, I can see the, the laser reflecting off the snow right here. It's so dim. It doesn't light up my hand very much, but it does light up my hand a bit. And the snow here where I'm walking with ice underneath is being lit up by the laser. Okay, so this is about seven or eight miles. So that's the laser, like seven, eight miles away. With my fingertips I'm touching the snow and with my thumb I'm touching the bottom of the camera. So that's, you know, that's good and close. I'm gonna lower the camera some more just out of, out of vision there. Okay, so now I'm about four inches off the snow right now. That last little bit of video that you saw, that was recorded close to the area where I kicked the snow away with my boot. So it's about four inches deep or so right there. Okay, so I'm still at the far end of the lake and I'm communicating here with the laser operator seven and a half miles away. I'm trying to find a, a, a little more illumination so uh, experimenting with uh, up and down on the laser. So it was about as good as what we could get at this end. But just the fact that I could communicate with him using a flashlight is significant. And uh, I'll explain that a little more in detail later also. So here I'm just getting ready to head back across the lake and uh, go back to the laser site. It's interesting to note how I could use that green dot from the laser way off in the distance as a guide to help me get back to where I started from. That little dot way off in the distance, it should have been way down the curve. I shouldn't have been able to see that. It didn't really matter where I was on the lake. I could always find that little dot and use it as a guide. So on the way back, once the odometer on the sled turned over one mile, then I stopped and I signaled out to the laser operator who's now right in at six and a half miles away trying to get a little more brightness onto the lake and it did seem brighter here than at the first test site as we were getting closer to the laser but I think the camera was zoomed a little and maybe trying to focus on a light that was on the north shore there regardless still got some pretty good shots here of the laser on the lake six and a half miles away so I thought of this later as I was editing this video that first test site at seven and a half miles out that ice may actually not be floating on water, it may or may not be, but it's close enough to the shore that the water could have been shallow enough that maybe the ice froze all the way down to the bank. And that shouldn't be too much of a problem, but let's say if the level of the lake drops, 
then there would be a perimeter of ice around the lake which would be higher and then the lake would be lower. So I, I didn't detect any signs of uh, changes in lake elevation at all. I think it's all fine. But in the future, if I do more of this, then uh, I want to make sure that all the test sites are a little ways off of the shore. The, the barrel and the laser, that was about 300 feet offshore. So if you're standing on a large curved surface, let's say you are over here, and if this ruler would represent your eye height, then by increasing your elevation, you should be able to see farther and farther around that curve providing there's nothing in the way that would obstruct your vision. So 8 inches per mile squared is a generally accepted formula for figuring out the amount of curve per mile. So that formula would look like this. And if I take a sphere with a radius of 3,959 miles and I put a straight tangent line along the top, so that's an imaginary line that I would measure down from, then uh, this formula with zero observer eye height would produce 8 inches of drop in the first mile, second mile would be 32 inches, third mile would be 72 inches, and it becomes progressively more because of this imaginary line along the top that's being measured down from. So this formula, once you get into really big numbers, then it becomes inaccurate. For example, if you would use this formula, it should you have a drop of 3,959 miles, but this formula at that great distance, it no longer works. I will provide a chart that gives accurate numbers, and also if I want to figure out how much drop per mile and include the observer eye height, for that I'll go online and uh, use a, an earth curve calculator where you have the option of entering in the observer eye height, and then that figures that out for me. Okay, so first let's have a look how this works out with my laser operator. I didn't outright go and measure his, uh, his eye height, but I'm assuming he's right in around five and a half feet to his eyes. Based on that, there should be 14 and a quarter, 14.28 feet of hidden distance here. And if I don't include this five and a half feet, then this amount of hidden curvature should be 37 and a half feet. So it's quite a difference that that height makes for the observer. And so, okay, so I needed to establish the observer height for this laser. And remember that barrel was sitting in a snowdrift that's about 12 inches high. And so assuming that many other snowdrifts along the way are also in around the 12 inch mark, I subtracted 12 inches off the total height of this assembly. So instead of 40 and 3 quarter to the uh, center of the lens, I uh, dropped that down to 28 and 3 quarter. So that was my observer eye height for the laser. So once again, seven and a half miles, and now I've dropped the observer height for the laser down to 2.4 feet. And then look what that does at the other end. So there should be 20.93 feet of hidden curvature at the far end. So these illustrations they're not done to scale and the angles and such they're not done correctly. So if you look for example if this is 2.4 feet at this end then comparatively speaking then this end to scale should actually be higher I'm not sure somewhere up higher in there. So also in this illustration now I've drawn in the ice level here so I found this very interesting how I did not have to try and figure out a way to elevate the camera way up high somewhere in this area to get a visual on the originating source of the laser way off in the distance. So instead I had the camera way down low here in this area somewhere and to give you an idea where that is see that's actually lower than the level of the laser. So I had that camera sitting about 10 inches above the ice so that is estimated, it could be a little higher, but the point is I didn't have to climb you know, a tall tree behind me in the bank somewhere and then try and get a visual on that laser. Like, no, it was like way, it was like down. 
So because that flashlight works so well communicating across the lake, I think we could have easily have done this experiment without the laser and instead used two powerful flashlights, one at either end of the lake facing towards each other. So instead of a laser operator at the far end, I would have a flashlight operator and then we would just shine to the other end of the lake where we think the other guy is with both flashlights on till we locate each other and then uh, figure out how high that flashlight had to be off the snow before we made contact. I found it really interesting how none of the observations I made on the lake that day showed any signs at all of being a spherical earth. Like not even a little. So here's some things that happened on the lake that I saw with my own eyes. One is there is no place along that lake that we were not able to use a flashlight to communicate with. Another one is there was no place along that lake where I could not use the end of that little green dot of the laser far away as a guide to return myself back to where I started. With the exception of maybe if I passed, you know, passed uh, an ice fishing shack or uh, also if, if I would go like way off to the side of the lake maybe then the laser gets really dim but as, as long as I'm, you know, reasonably close to the side of that beam then I could always see 100%, I could always find that little green dot. Uh, another one is, we were able to shine the laser on the snow at seven and a half miles away and also at six and a half miles away. So that that is measured. So here I have to make an assumption, but I'm very confident that uh, I'm not incorrect. But there is no place along that entire lake where we would not have been able to shine the laser. And the reason why I have to say that's an assumption is because I didn't mark off all kinds of different uh, spots along the lake and actually, you know, measure. So the video camera was able to pick up the originating source of the beam. That little green dot off in the distance with the camera height at about 10 inches above ice level. 10 inches above ice level, facing towards where the beam is coming from, and there is a little green dot seven and a half miles away. So the same thing would have happened at six and a half miles from the laser. So here I have to make an assumption because I didn't actually try it, but uh, because I could see the laser shining on top of the snow at six and a half miles away, there is no reason why I would think that if I had taken the camera and held it down low and peeked it up from behind uh, one of the little snow drifts that it would not have been able to see the end of that laser. So originally I wanted to run that beam out over the lake, make the beam as small as possible, level it and then take measurements at some different points along the lake from the ice up to the laser and see what I would come up with. So I'm thinking that for me to do this kind of testing to do it at night over a frozen lake in the winter, that's probably the best time for the minimum amount of atmospheric distortion and refraction. And uh, I'm thinking that's because probably the temperature of the snow and the temperature of the air would be similar. And uh, generally the humidity is lower in the winter time. So combine that with doing it at night when the, when the sun is off the snow. And altogether, I think that's probably the best time. So I was probably over 50% flat earth before I started this video and after seeing what I saw on the lake that just pushes it up higher. And I would still like to do more laser experiments over a frozen lake with uh, more precision and a, a narrowed beam as much as I possibly can and get some actual measurements. So I think that'd be really good data to collect. So if I was somebody who totally believed that there is no creator and that everything happened by chance, then flat earth would completely rattle my whole belief system like real bad and shake it to the core because how do you have flat earth and no creator? It's just suddenly it just doesn't make any sense. Like there has to be, there has to be an intelligent creator to design it all and make it all function. So if something happens in nature and I can't understand the mechanics of it, that doesn't mean that it can't happen. It just means that I don't understand it. So for myself, flat earth would not unravel my belief system. I already believe that we have this amazing creator who does wonderful things for us. And so if I can't understand everything he does, that doesn't mean that 
he doesn't have it under control. So when I read about creation in the beginning of Genesis, what I understand is that the sun, moon, and stars were all placed in the firmament with water above the firmament. And how is that going to fit together with what they teach us in science? And so I've mentioned this in a previous video. I've been starting to throw out some of the stuff they taught me in school. And I'm, I'm not talking about reading and how to add, but I'm talking about just the stuff that's like anti-biblical. For me, the shape of the earth, it doesn't have to be a round spinning ball to match what science says. So about seven years ago, my wife, she slipped on some ice, fell down, injured her knee, and it hurt her quite a bit. So after some time, she ended up at a chiropractor with not much for results, and then a physiotherapist, and not much was going on. And it's almost a year later, or about a year later, and she still has pain in her knee. And even when she lays down, she would still have some pain, not as much. So she's been a Christian for years, and one day she's laying in bed and she prays for healing. She said, I talked to her about this the other day, she said it was about one second after she prayed, she felt a tingling feeling, it was either on or in her knee, I forget what she said, but she felt this tingling feeling and she could feel right away that the pain was gone. And that's, so that's like six years ago or so, and she, since that day, since that moment, she has not had pain in that knee, and it's been all these years and it's just, it's, it's gone. And at the time, I don't think I took it seriously enough because that was, I would think that's the first miraculous healing between her and I that I'm aware of. So about 22 years ago, I had an amazing deliverance from an addiction. And I guess it's sort of like a healing, maybe I could have included it in an earlier part of the video when I was talking about my wife's knee. So anyways, so for years and years, I struggled with this addiction and I couldn't shake it, I couldn't get rid of it, and I just, I hated it. It all came to a head with me on my knees, in tears, before Jesus, crying and asking for forgiveness and in shame and just, I was so sorry of the way I had been behaving. And, and it ended, well, I didn't know it had ended. What happened was, so, you have an addiction when you keep going back and back, but what happened is, so, so days would go by, and it was probably a week had gone by before I realized that I hadn't thought about my addiction. It was like, it was, it was rather strange for me. So then, weeks turned into months, months turned into years, and nothing. It was just, it was just gone. That chain was just off me. <laughs> was so awesome so that there's more to that story than what I'm telling you guys and uh, that chain is still off me to this day like I say there's that I could probably make a whole video on that if I dare <laughs> and the whole thing here what I'm trying to tell you people is in case someone out there thinks that evolution is true and there is no God there is no creator I'm trying to tell you that I'm trying to tell you that it's don't fall for the tricks and the lies. He is real and he's awesome. So I left you guys a link to the book of John from the Bible. So I really encourage you guys to investigate Jesus. Do some research there. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So he is the door. He is the only way. So check him out. And guys, huge thanks for watching this video. Even if you only watched a minute, thanks for that.